Good morning. Welcome to Congdon Street Baptist Church, where everybody's welcome, nobody's perfect, and anything is possible. We are live on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, straight from Providence to your living room. We are so glad you're tuned in. Take a moment, if you will, to share our live stream online and welcome someone into our worship experience today. Good morning to you. To all of our special guests, welcome home. You are in a community of dreamers, innovators, doers, and active agents of change. You are amazing. Please connect with us. You can use your phone and snap a picture of the QR code on the screen or text the phrase CSBC join to 84576. Welcome home. July is our Selah month here at Cognitary Baptist Church. The word Selah is, we, is a word we see all throughout scripture that speaks to a pause or breath. July at Cognitive Street is a month to pause our weekly activities and events for you to spend time with your family, your friends, in personal study, and more. We will have worship every Sunday online and in person. Join us this Tuesday for conference call Bible study at noon. You can call in at 605-313-4159 and use the passcode 422-185 to join. Jersey Sunday. The NBA and NHL playoffs are in full swing. On Sunday, July 11th, we want to see your favorite team jersey. Feel free to wear any team as we celebrate hashtag Team CSBC on per, in person and online. Workout with CSBC. Dress in your best workout clothes on the second Sunday and every second Sunday this summer as we work out following worship. Join us as Sister Jeannie Carson will lead us to work out. Did someone say container garden at CSBC? It's time to plant your indoor seeds. Clean out last year's debris and start gathering those containers. Take a look on the railroad ties at the church and you'll see all the plants that we're planting. For more information, go to www.congdenstreet.org backslash community. And that's all that's coming down your street at Congdon Street this week. As you can tell here at CSBC, we dream, we innovate, we do, and we change. If you need to contact the church, please be sure to call 401-421-4032. You can email us at info at congdenstreet.org. You can find all church information online at www.congdenstreet.org. Be sure to follow us on all the socials on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Feel free to check out our podcast on iTunes and Spotify. Most of all, if you're vaccinated, give somebody a hug this week. Now, let's jump back into worship. everybody and welcome to CSBC online we are super excited that you have joined us well today we have a special treat because we are all watching online today listen as you know our current building is being renovated so if you're in um, Providence our building our historic building on 17 Cotton Street is completely being renovated so we do worship outside but since the weather is not on our side um, we decided to all be online like old times. So praise God that we have the ability to be flexible as a church and to reach people no matter where they are. So we are super excited. Happy Independence Day today. This would be a great time of worship as we reflect on the freedom that we have here in this country and the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. It's an amazing time. One of the things that we're gonna reflect on today is having communion together. And I think it's such a special time as we kind of reflect on the history of our people as black people, the history of this country, um, and also the history of all the things that Jesus has done for us to sit and truly reflect on what does freedom mean to you? Pastor Justin has an amazing sermon in James and we are super excited to continue that. But what does freedom mean to you? As you enter in, we ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to comment out what's your name, probably say hi to everybody so that we can just meet you where you are. If you have a prayer request, we would love to pray with you. If you have a praise report, we wanna praise God for you. Um, so whatever it is, please be sure to use the comment feature so that we know and we can engage fully with each other. It's more fun when we all do it. So use your favorite emoji, whatever that is, to help to encourage each other in the Lord. I hope that 
you guys have your Bibles ready. Um, we love to open up and, and worship with just scripture to kind of center us on what we're doing today. So today we're reading from Psalms 124. Psalms 124. It reads, God, if God hadn't been for us, all together now, Israel sing out. If God hadn't been for us, when everyone went against us, we would have been swallowed alive by the violent anger, swept away by flood of rage, drowned in torrent. We would have lost our lives in the wild raging water. Oh, blessed be God. He didn't go off and leave, leave us. He didn't abandon us defenseless, bliss, helpless as rabbits in a pack of snarling dogs. We've flown free from the fangs, free of their traps, free as a bird. Their grip is broken. We're free as a bird in flight. God's strong name is our help. The same God who made heaven and earth. I'm going to repeat that last verse. Verse 8 says, God's strong name is our help. The same God who made heaven and earth. I don't know what that means to you today, but what it means to me is the same God that made heaven and earth cares about each and every detail of our lives, from what makes us happy, from what makes us sad. He cares intricately. Yes, he's a majestic God. He makes the seasons change. He makes the rain fall. He makes the sun come up. But guess what? He cares about what you care about. He cares deeply for you. And that's why we worship him today. So let's center our minds and our hearts on that today. Hey. Is this your first time worshiping with us today? Well, welcome. We are super excited that you are here today. Um, we had a new member to join our congregation last week, and God continues to allow our numbers um, in our community to expand like never before. Listen, we wanna say hi to you, perhaps give you a swag bag of all of our community uh, gear. If you just text CSBC join to 84576, we want to be sure that we get your information, but also get some information to you so we can say welcome. And it's super glad to have you a part of our community. So let's have a waving hand emoji to all of our new friends um, here that are joining with us. Awesome. Last but not least, before we really get started into um, our morning worship, one of the things that we do that kind of binds us together, whether we are in person, online, all here today, it tells us who we are, but it also tells our community what we're about. It's our vision statement that we say. Our vision statement will come up across the screen. I hope that you know it. I will say it, and why don't you read it on the screen with me um, together. We are a community of Christ-led dreamers, innovators, doers, and active agents of change in our providence. We create spaces to learn about Christ. We radically challenge each other to live in communion with Christ, and we are continuously pressed to lead others to Christ. Simply put, we learn, we live, and we lead each and every day of our lives. If you ask what we do here at Contra Street, what do we say to them? We learn, we live, and we lead. That's it, that's it, just all to the glory of God. So get ready to worship today. Let's get ready, bring all that you have. We have so much to just thank God for. We have so much to worship God for. And if you feel like you don't have anything to worship God for, guess what, we're gonna praise and worship for our neighbor. We are praying for you that God meets you in a mighty way. So let's get ready to worship.
us and well amen i feel like we have so many new friends here and even old friends that have been a part of our community since forever i just kind of want to remind you and help you to connect with our church in a meaningful way do you want to know like more about or dive deeper into pastor justin's sermons into james and other topics that he has or kind of go back to old sermons that you really love and you want to listen to all of that can be found on our website at cognitstreet.org you can simply scan this qr code that would be right here scan it just simply open up the camera app point and shoot and there you go it'll go to our website our instagram our facebook you can connect with us uh, via our website you can write in the comments or you can always text CSBC join to 84576 so that we are able to connect with you and give you more information. Do you want to know more about our church history? What groups that we have? When do groups meet? Um, how can you get involved? What are some things that you can do? Have no fear. Hidingstreet.org is here. We are just super excited to just help you to connect. There should be no barriers. We have plenty of work that you can do. We have plenty of spaces for you to volunteer. We have plenty of spaces for you to belong. We have tons of community just waiting for you. And if you are not in a group yet, I really don't know what you're waiting for. We have groups for everyone, for men, women, married couples, children, youth, teenagers. There's a group, seniors, there's a group for everybody. So there is no excuse to be isolated. We want everyone to be in community together. We may be separated, we may be online, but we are stronger together um, more than ever before. So follow these simple steps, click the QR code or simply go to cognizantstreet.org where you can find all these information or comment that you wanna know more information or you just wanna be a part of our community. We look forward to meeting and working with you. Well, hey everyone, Pastor Justin here. Come on, if you're happy in the Lord, put those blessed hands together. If you're on Facebook, give us a, 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 a memoji or a gif. If you're on YouTube, give us an emoji. Come on, I'll wait for your happy in the Lord emojis. Come on, come on, give me your happy in the Lord. Give me your blessed hands, your praying hands, your hallelujah hands, whatever it is. Come on, give us something so you can see that you guys are happy to be alive today. Amen. My name is Justin. I'm privileged to serve as a pastor here at Congregation Street Baptist Church up on the hill in College Hill. Today, we're not up on the hill. We're actually down closer to the water uh, at Veterans Memorial Park out in Pawtucket. Uh, Pawtucket, sorry, don't don't get me, uh, Pawtucket. And uh, so um, it's just beautiful. We're here because, well, it's July 4th and it's Independence Day. Uh, I want to honor and recognize the fact that we are in, um, a one, uh, we're in America on this Independence and Freedom Day. Um, and I get, let me say this before you all tune me out, I get the broad spectrum and everything going on in our world right now that can that can make it seem um, like like about the, about the words freedom and about what community looks like and race and, and equity and diversity and equality. There's a lot of issues. And so today I want to challenge you to just engender community. However you want to celebrate this weekend, whether it's the day off, whether it's the independence and freedom in America, whether it's the the, the, the work you're putting the hand your hands or hands and feet are being work putting uh, you're, you're, you're putting your hands and feet to Take this time today, the fourth, and tomorrow, the fifth. If you're off, take this time to engender and enjoy community, enjoy life, enjoy looking in the mirror and knowing that you are a reflection of God's grace, peace, and mercy. And for those of you that celebrated Juneteenth, like your boy did a couple weeks ago, we holla back at Black Folks Freedom Day. Well, the last time, the last person that found out in Texas um, that it was there in June 19th. So, however you want to celebrate today, don't let anybody tell you what you need to do or how you need to feel this weekend. You get a day and a day off tomorrow to do that very thing so enjoy your weekend all right um, so speaking of enjoying your weekend um, well let me mention one other thing too it is offering time and giving time at our church amen uh, you can give at congdenstreet.org backslash give um, you can give by dropping it off in church thank you to all of you who've been so awesome with your generosity that's allowed us to really continue to be the hands and feet of Christ and continue to innovatively look forward uh, we are thinking not just we but um, as started planning for the fall we have back to school we have um, our, 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 our Thanksgiving baskets of the month of November um, adopting families for Christmas 
Christmas in December. I mean, there's just a lot of work, domestic violence awareness, breast cancer awareness, back, I mean, um, college student welcome back. There's ways we're gonna continue to build our community. Your generosity helps us do and keep our promises, not just to you, but to what God is calling us to be as the kingdom of God. So you can go ahead and give at congressstreet.org backslash give, and you can take a moment to do that right now. Um, you can double click over, double tap over in your phone, computer, whatever you're at right now to give. And thank you guys also very much for your generosity. We will have communion following the sermon today. Um, so we'll have communion, we'll have a hymn together, then we'll have communion together and then depart from there. And so if you are looking to take communion with us, grab your bread, grab some water, grab some, grab some bread and wine or juice, whatever that is for you. And then also those of you that say, hey, Pastor Justin, I wanna take it in community. We're gonna also have communion next Sunday in person when we get together uh, on the second Sunday outside. All right, so that's that's what's coming up and coming down your street of Congress Street, kicking note of all the, uh, the news and events because next Sunday is Jersey Sunday and we're celebrating the Milwaukee Bucks. That's all, that's all I got to put there. Uh, we're going to celebrate the Milwaukee Bucks. Hallelujah. Uh, on next Sunday. Um, and speaking of offering, my last little announcement, sorry, I'm going to get into the sermon. Um, speaking of offering, so we had a security meeting about our security team and ways that we can be intentional about our security efforts here at Congdon Street. And uh, one of the things that we made a decision to do is to have buckets and boxes, a bucket available as you come into worship where you can give. And we're going to start adding that to our worship experience. One of the reasons we want to do that is to make sure we have a safe environment for when we're taking up offering. You guys are giving very generously. Our congregation is expanding, and I believe the Lord deserves some praise. That means the expansion means we have to evaluate, right? I'm going to give you all that again because that was, that, was that was a Lester quote right there. Expansion means evaluation. And as we expand, as our body of Christ expands, as our worship community expands, as our numbers expand, which I'm grateful for, Hallelujah, right? I told you guys before about the numbers of churches that have closed, the number of churches that have fallen down in the midst of COVID, churches that have merged with others. As we expand, it calls evaluation. One of the things we evaluate is our process for taking up offerings. So therefore, we're adding to our worship experience a place for you to give as you come into worship. Now, one of the things we're going to do right now for the next couple of weeks, we'll have more opportunities to give, but eventually, I'm telling you right now, about a month or so, it's gonna come down to just giving online and giving as you come into church. Not to take away anything from the worship movement inside of our worship experience, but y'all, we're gonna be safe with our resources and safe with what's going on in our world. And so we're starting that process beginning next Sunday, and you'll be able to give as you come into worship um, on next Sunday. And we're excited about our security measures, our security team, everyone who's volunteering. And if that's a place you wanna volunteer, go right ahead, all right? We're gonna jump into the word of God. It is not a beautiful day out here today, but this week, well, like Friday, it's gonna be nice. And so um, you're looking for something fun to do. Um, let's let's think about some fun things to do around Rhode Island. So let's see, let's go around Rhode Island really quickly and let's show you some fun things you can do in Rhode Island. For example, you can take a walk on one of our many different walkways along all the different waters and rivers and oceans all around the state. Simply look on Google for that. But let me show you some more things, come with me or any one of our amazing parks like this one. I'm at India Point Park where it's super cool. You can take the ferry to go to Newport. You can guys go to Bristol, you can go to Block Island. I mean, just so many amazing things you can do. Let's see, what else is there to do in Rhode Island in the summer? Or as I'm here on West Minister Street or any of the uh, many, many streets off the wall, all across Rhode Island that have amazing food and amazing communities, small businesses, shop local in Rhode Island, all these different places to eat. But maybe you're looking for something for family fun, so let's let's try to find that too. Or you can come all the way out here as a family to Lincoln Park or any of the numerous parks across our state and the beaches and kayaking and horseback riding and hiking all across our state to enjoy. The beautiful thing about Island, there's something for everybody who wants to do something. All right, let's go back into worship. Well, how'd you like that, right? So there's a number of things you can do. Google is your friend, but have a chance. This month of July, as I mentioned earlier in our announcements and said last week is our Selah month. It's a deep breath. It's a chance to not have so much going on throughout the week to make sure we have everything just going on on Sunday. So you have a chance to go travel, go engage. And so we don't have anything extra happening this month of July outside of just church on Sundays. And so please take the time to vacation, to go out, to go someplace. Um, and not let the church be one of the things that keeps you from doing all of those amazing things, all right? We're gonna jump into the Word of God. The Word of God today is found in the book of James. 
We're, we're still in James chapter 1. Told you guys before we're going to slow walk the book of James. 40% of you in our survey that we sent out on spiritual development responded that if there was one book you wanted to study, it was the book of James. And so want to take our time to walk through and slow walk the book of James. So what is the book of James about? We're in James 1 still. What is the book of James all about? Well, the first thing, remember, the big idea of James is to listen to God, listen to Jesus, and do what Jesus says. Listen to Jesus and do what he says. How does James fit into God's big story? Well, three ways. Number one, inward faith produces outward actions. Number two, selfishness causes division, but obedience to God brings unity. Number three, God brings peace to us personally and in our relationships. That's what James, how James fits into God's larger story. How does James fit into my story? Well, first of all, when you have a need, Jesus wants you to ask him for help. Number two, our words and actions can influence people to move closer to Jesus or further away from Jesus. And number three, God doesn't judge anyone based upon wealth or poverty, and neither should we. So that's what we see in terms of the big idea of James, how James fits into God's story, and how James fits into our story. So now, I want you to go to the book of James, I'm gonna look at two different translations, but I wanna go to James chapter one, verse nine. I told you guys last week we were getting more into, remember the book of James is set up like the book of Proverbs. It's, it's Greco-Roman ethical teaching. It's very beautiful Greek, very beautiful language, and the book of James, in the way that it's set up, um, really gives us some hardcore one, two, three principles. What we're gonna see in verses nine through 12 today is now the book end of really verse 2 and it kind of closes a thought as James then continues to begin another thought in our next uh, sermon next week all right so in James chapter 1 beginning at verse number 9 listen to the word of the Lord it says this believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position but the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like wildflowers for the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant it blossoms and fails uh, falls and beauty is destroyed in the same way the rich will fade away when they go about their business blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test that person will receive the crown of life the lord has promised to those who love him we're taking a look at the new international version let's also read the message translation i want you to see another translation when down and outers get a break cheer when the arrogant rich are brought down to size cheer Prosperity is as short-lived as a wildflower, so don't ever count on it. You know that as soon as the sun rises, pouring down its scorching heat, the flower withers, its petals wilt, and before you know it, that beautiful face is a barren stem. Well, that's a picture of the prosperous life. At the very moment, everyone is looking at admiration and praise to nothing. Anyone who meets a test, testing challenge head on and manages to stick it out is mighty fortunate. For persons loyally in love with God, its reward is life and more life. Let's pray together. God. Let us see eternity today. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Over quarantine, I don't have a title for these James series. I thought I was going to have a title every week, but um, today's title is just literally James 1, verses 9 through 12, right? Um, quarantine and this last year and a half, uh, for a lot of people, and myself included, picked up a lot of hobbies. And one of the hobbies I picked up and uh, learned more about was the science behind barbecue. I, I've, I've started liking it. I'm not the greatest at it, um, um, but I've, I've enjoyed barbecuing, and that's one of my hobbies. And and uh, I started doing it a lot more and cooking a lot more. I got a new grill. I got a smoker. It's a lot of fun. And uh, I started eating a lot of red meat, steaks and uh, pork and things like that. Um, I had my annual physical, went to my doctor because some things were going wrong. And my doctor said, Justin, what does your diet look like? What are you eating? How are you living? And I told him, I said, you know, I've been eating a lot of ribs and eating a lot of pork because I found a brand, I got a brand new grill and I have two grills and I'm having a lot of fun doing all this grill because it's a hobby for me and something that's life giving. And my doctor said something to me. He said, Justin, um, for you, you can't eat that much salt. Red meat will kill you. Um, and hereditary things, all that. You can't eat that much red meat. And uh, it was it was hard for me to take that because I'm like, I need to, to figure some things out. You know, you can only do so much with chicken and you can only do so much with turkey on a grill. And, uh, and, and he said to me, he said, and, and, and he said to me, you know, Justin, as great as you want to be with all of this, you do it too much. The thing that that you love doing can kill you. Um, the very thing that gives us life could kill us. And the very thing that gives you life could kill you. And I take that principle and apply it to this text because what James chapter 1 verses 9 through 12 is really engaging with is that principle. The very things that we think give us life 
can turn around and kill us and distract us from what really can give us life. I want you to consider in your life the things that give you life. I want you to consider in your life the things that give you joy, the things that, not joy, the things that give you life, the things that you feel fulfill, bring fulfillment. Too much of anything can be a bad thing. And the same way I'm talking about how too much red meat could literally kill me, and that goes for anybody, not just me, so don't, don't read too much into what I'm saying. I think the same thing applies too when we read in this text when he talks about wealth, when he talks about what, what has our focus, that too much of that can literally kill us. And that's what James is doing. James is calling us to consider the trials in our lives. Remember in back in verses five and six, our great, verses five and six, that perseverance will work have its work, that the greatest thing in our, that we need in our trials is not more, not more relief, but wisdom. Ask a giving God, like we talked about last week. And James said, makes a hard turn at the end of this to now get to now, what are things that we can learn or brought on or revealed while we're in trials? What are idols that are brought in and brought up while we're in trials that God can help us destroy? Because remember the goal of this, and I want to make sure we always center ourselves on the goal of the book of James. Remember James's goal, halakleros, back in verse 4, that, that the we lack nothing. Can you say that with me? Say, I lack nothing. I lack nothing. That was the goal of James, halakleros, that I want people to be mature and perfect in their faith when perseverance has its perfect work so that you can see that in Christ you lack nothing. Remember last week we talked about asking a giving God is because you serve a God who wants the best for me. Can you say that? Just said God wants the best for me. That's what we see in the book of James, all right? So to put this in perspective, James is talking to a context, talking to us about how we live in the world and how Christ is calling us to live. And in this case, James then says there are three idols, if you will, three things that kind of come up. One is good, two aren't so good, that, that we can apply in various ways, but also are made known in the midst of trials. So let me tell you this, this text is really uncomfortable, but don't tune me out because I believe there's something powerful in it. So don't tune me out when I start talking money because I'm not talking money in the way that, that, that it may be perceived in talking money. There's three things that James unearths in verses nine through 12 that, that kind of bookends everything when it comes to trials and tribulations and patience. First of all, poverty, verse, verse nine. Secondly, prosperity, this verse is 10 through 11. And then thirdly, the promise, which is verse number 12. The overall goal I want to show you today is that God wants our focus to be on eternity, not today. But I can have a great today when my focus is on eternity, right? God desires that my focus is on eternity, not just today, because I can have a great today with a focus on eternity. So let's unpack this. Let's go to verse number nine. Verse nine, he starts talking about poverty, right? Three things that unearth and trust, poverty, poverty. Look at verse 9. I'm going to read three different translations. The NIV says it like this. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. The King James Version puts it like this. Let the brother of low degree uh, rejoice that he is exalted. And the message translation puts it like this. When down in outers get a break, cheer. Now what, is, what does this mean? Let's unpack the language here first. Because unpacking the language is going to show us the text. So the text, number one, is for people who put their trust in Jesus. People who place their faith in Jesus, a brother or a sister in Christ. Literally, one commenter says it's a member of a church. That's, that's what this means. Uh, the phrasing of low degree, of humble circumstances, is this mentioning of what it means to actually be a Christian. Um, at the time, th this is before the word Christian was starting to be used in the church of Judea. And so because it's before the word Christian was even being used, the, word, the phrasing of low degree was then saying it was akin to what Jesus did. And we're going to see in Philippians chapter 2 in a second, this humility that came from Jesus, right? This low servant, this low degree, and that's the case here. And I'll show you even what it means. So if you go to Acts chapter 11 with me, go to your Bibles, Acts chapter 11. Welcome everyone to church. I'm glad you guys are with us today. We're at Veterans Memorial Park, uh, just engaging. Um, very more auditorium pavilion uh, engaging in uh, Independence Day so glad you guys are with us uh, in James chapter 1 go to Acts chapter 11 I want you to see this so I don't want to just say it so you know what I mean um, Acts chapter 11 says this then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul verse 25 and when he found him he brought him to Antioch so for a whole year Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people the disciples were called Christians for the first time in Antioch the word Christians there literally means little Christ and what they're saying is that you look so much like Christ that we're going to give you a slang term, and that is you're a Christian. 
that's the first time the word Christian was used. For James, that's before, he, this James was written before the book of Acts was written, right? Before we get the story of what happened there with Barnabas and Saul. Therefore, when James is writing the phrasing of low degree is akin to what Paul talks about in Philippians chapter 2 because we believe Paul actually built upon what James is talking about, this phrasing of low degree that Jesus humbled himself. He took on the position of a servant, low degree. So he was saying, those of you who have low degree, right? Um, so this is not a money text. Rather, it's showing us there's no loss in Christ. That what the text is showing us here is that in Christ, I gain everything. In Christ, I also lose nothing, right? Um, the high position according to James, then on the contrary, he says here, so first of all, when a brother is in low degree, that when a brother is a Christian, when a brother is saved, rejoice because they are exalted. When, when someone is humble, rejoice because they're being exalted, right? Um, and, and the high position then, this exaltation, this high position, because the NIV puts it, brothers in the humble circumstances, I'll take pride in the position. This high position for James is a spiritual state. It's a spiritual reality, right? The suggestion here is, while I may be poor in material wealth, I have every spiritual blessing in Christ. Someone say, I like nothing. I want you to see this, that while you're poor or you're humble, you're of low degree in material wealth, you have every spiritual blessing that comes in Jesus. You have a high position in Jesus, so boast about your high position in Jesus. That's verse number nine. The world will tell you that there's others who are grateful for your high standing in the world, where Jesus is challenging us, James is challenging us as Christians to rejoice in our high standing in Christ. The reason being, at this time, there were many, many Christians who were being martyred for the faith. The left and right, folk were dying, so they were making sure we logged their stories. And so because of that, James is saying, since we don't know if we're literally going to make it to tomorrow, since we don't know if we're literally going to make it to next year, since we don't know if Jesus is going, they live with this anticipation that Jesus is coming back in any given second. Right, because of that, James says, "Exalt, be, I mean, rejoice that you have a high spiritual position in Christ." That's what James is saying here. To prove it to you, that the posture that James is challenging the church people to take on is what we also see in Philippians chapter two. Grab your Bibles, go to Philippians two. I want you to see this so you know I'm not making it up. Go to Philippians chapter two. These birds are screaming today. <laughs> go to Philippians chapter two. Go to verse number six. It says this, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God to be something to use his own advantage, or that he made himself nothing, took on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself, being obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore Jesus, God, exalted him to the highest space, there's that word again, and gave him the name above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to glory God of the Father. See this? Humility then in the low space in the is a in the sorry. Humility then is a low space in the world because humility isn't done. That's it. Humility in the world seems low. You're meek, you're mild, but humility in Christ is a high space because I'm imitating Christ. That's that's why Philippians 2 is so important to this argument today. That humility in the world is 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 seen as meek and mild and talking down whereas for christ for james humility in christ is the imitation of christ right that i am humble in my flesh so that i can be exalted in christ through christ for the work of christ more than likely what james was acknowledging here is the beatitudes in matthew chapter 5 one of the beatitudes says blessed are those who are poor in spirit the Greek there, the word there literally says, I bless are those who are bankrupt of self-sufficiency. They know that they have nothing to bring to the table to make themselves right with God. That's who we're proving here. So blessed is the person then who is utterly dependent on God. That's what James is talking about. Because our greatest blessing is who we are in Christ. Our value in Jesus. Hear me. Your greatest blessing is who you are in Christ. How you value your value in the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me ask you a question. Do you value your relationship with Jesus? Do you see how Christ values you? If you see how Christ values you, 
there's certain things you will not let happen, certain certain things you will not engage in, and certain ways you will not speak because you are holding on to your greatest blessing, which is your value in the Lord Jesus Christ. So never dumb yourself down to how others see you, but raise yourself up to how Jesus sees you. And if you don't know how Jesus sees you, if you're saying, Pastor Justin, I, my life is this, my life is that, I don't know. Here's my challenge to you, verse, verse 5 from last week, ask a giving God for wisdom so you can see how God sees you. All right? So let's address poverty in the text. It's warm out. Let's address poverty in the text. Because some of us, you're reading this text, you're saying, Pastor Justin, my translation talks about poverty. What about those of us who are struggling financially? So let's address poverty. In the book of Acts, to go to your Bibles, Acts chapter 6, deacons were called to meet the needs of the people in the congregation. The purpose of it all was that, so deacons were called, they were raised up, so that the preachers, people like me, their only concentration was on the gospel. Our, our goal was to make sure that there was a word from God that was clear from God every single week to not lead the people astray. So that's the purpose of pastors and preachers. The purpose of deacons then were to come in and to create framework to ensure that the poor who were coming to the preachers poor that were coming to the priests made sure that the people always had needs met that was the goal of deacons in the text and so what would the the church then was called according to Acts chapter 6 to care for the members of the church they knew each I hear this and I want you to hear this they knew each other well enough that they could express I have a need without shame because the purpose of the church was to care for the people who were in it without shame. One of the things I think that's messed up, I don't think our church is a bad job of this at all. So this is not an indictment of our own church, but I see a lot of times, and those of you who've joined our congregation, you sometimes judge us based upon what's happened in other spaces. And then you get like, oh my gosh, congregation like everywhere, right? Um, the, 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 the goal the, I've seen and I've been a part of churches where it's shameful. Like, I remember times when I was in college, I didn't eat for weeks on end. Like, I lost so much weight once. And I told people that I was, like, trying to lose weight, and it wasn't because I literally just wasn't eating. Um, because I was, too, I was too full of shame to go to my church and ask for food at the end of a service, right? I was too full of shame to do so. But the purpose of the church is so that you don't have that shame. And that God calls people forward so that even in poverty, the church contradicts that poverty. And I'm going to show you in Acts chapter 6. Acts 6 says this. Go to Acts 6 verse 1. Hope y'all guys are engaging this today. I, I'm putting a lot of work into this. Um, I, 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 I hope I hope it's blessing you. Um, um, Acts 6, verse 1. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because the widows are being overlooked for the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and told us it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God to wait on tables. Pause. So all the disciples, their goal was to focus on the gospel, but yet the church had need. So then they gave structure and stability, like our own congregation, structure and stability. So verse three, brothers and sisters, choose seven men, I wanna put here, and women among you, who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom, and will turn this responsibility over to them so we can give our attention and to the, to the min, prayer and ministry of the word. So the disciples said, our ministry is this, they called seven deacons, people of wisdom, to just ask a giving God for wisdom. They called seven. So this is how it is applied. The church's purpose is to fulfill the needs of the people. The church was built to meet the needs of the people that you can express need without shame. That's why small groups are so important at this church. That's why when we fellowship and we engage and we ask you to comment and we ask you to talk back to people, it's so important so that when there's a need or when there's celebration, there's no shame. There's no arrogance, right? That's why I love celebrating each other. That's why we ask you to comment. That's why we ask you to like videos. That's why we ask you to get up and go talk to people. That's why we ask you to go to small groups. That's why we ask you to come to Zoom calls. That's why we ask you to come to conferences. That's why we ask you to turn your camera on, not to put you on front street, but so that we can celebrate and mourn without shame or arrogance, right? It takes away the needs we have because we all need Jesus to fill our really deep needs and so it takes away shame right so that that's why groups and com that's why like you hear Courtney and I talk all the time like comment please comment someone say something someone know who we are because we want to know who you are not so we can get in your business but so that if you ever have a need or you want to celebrate there's no shame in your needs or celebration so the first thing the first idol in this case 
if you will, the word idle is a funny word, but in trials, the first thing that comes up in trial, you see poverty. Secondly, the text shows us, verse numbers 10 through 11, is prosperity. Look at the text. Um, look at the text, verses 10, verse 10 and 11. It says this, But the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they'll pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with a scorching heat and withers to plant. It blossoms and fails. Its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away, even as they go about their business. So let's unpack this. Don't tune me out. Because what this text is not telling us, is this text is this 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 text is not saying to get rid of all of your money, right? This is, and this also isn't a text on financial planning. Let's unpack this. So this this literally means material wealth. This text speaks material wealth, and what it mean, what does it mean to glory and humiliation, right? The enemy uses this language. The poor is in a high position, the rich in a low position. So how do the rich glory, right? New Living Translation puts it like this: and those who are rich should boast that God has humbled them. So what does all this mean? Being humbled by God, the Greek there, the word humble there, humiliation there, means I've been gifted by God. That's it. Being humbled by God means I've been gifted by God. Humility is not seeing yourself less than who you are. It means seeing yourself correctly. I'm going to say this again. Humility, according to James, is not seeing yourself less than who you are, but it's seeing yourself correct. It's seeing your value and your purpose and your worth as God sees it. That's humility. That I will follow God. That's humility. And so we don't see this in our world. You guys heard me say this earlier about exalt high positions. Because we spend so much time demeaning ourselves. I can't do it. I'm not good enough. God doesn't love me. God don't care about me. Or we're exalting ourselves. This is how great I am. This is what I've accomplished. Talk about this last week. Are we, are we, where's our soul anchored? Is your soul anchored in your money? Your soul anchored in your marriage? Soul anchored in how you look? Or is your soul anchored in Jesus? What James is saying is your wealth is not connected to your values. Exalt and worship God that you have value. What you possess is not all you possess. What you own is not what defines you. The world says it does. The Bible says it doesn't. So it's a good thing to be humbled by God, to be gifted by God. Hear me? So I hear like, you know, that person's been humbled because we want to talk about failure. That person's been, no, that person's been humbled because they're gifted. You've been humbled because you're gifted. Now, are you trusting that position you have in Jesus? That's what this text is saying. Let's address the elephant in the room. James gives a paragraph to the rich and gives a sentence to the poor because he's trying to show us humility takes you higher. And so if you're going to have pride in anything, do not have pride in your material wealth. Have pride in your gifting. Be proud that you have value. Be proud that you're gifted in Jesus. Once you see this, this is not an excuse. So like, I don't want you to see this. Like a lot of times this is the excuse I hear when it's like, don't pay preachers and don't pay pastors and don't pay musicians and don't pay singers and don't, it's, it's a slap at people with wealth because it's just a, some, or it slaps people who've got money, who've been successful. So it's like, well, you need to be humble. And, and all of this making, is it James does, let me say this. James does not say anything against money. James also does not say anything against the poor. Let, let's just pop that bubble. This is not a text to say pastors need to be broke and musicians need to be on oodles and noodles and no one in church. This is not what this text is saying. Here's what this text is saying. Money, too much of it and too little of it can cloud your vision of God. That, that's what the, I want you to hear me. Material wealth and possessions can cloud your vision of God. Too much of it and too little of it. And so either God is giving, you're praying that God gives you more or, right, God is only good enough to give it or take it from you or take it from other people. And the reason being is it's harder to hear God when you have too much stuff clouding your vision. People in poverty are looking for a home. People for, with stuff are losing hope. So I want you to stop. But what I want you to do in this text and what James is showing us, because remember the context, he's talking to martyrs people who are risking their lives for the faith, I want you to move from seeing your money temporarily, seeing your wealth temporarily, seeing your possessions temporarily, and begin to see it with eternity. See your marriage with eternity in mind. 
right? James is trying to help see us and help all of us see that wealth is passing. All of this stuff is fleeting. Clothes are passing. And I know this sounds like a very funeral type message, but it's sad the only time we talk about eternity is at funerals. All this stuff is passing. So it doesn't have the weight we give it. I want you to see your life with eternity in mind. Our salvation is not for works on earth only. Our salvation is with eternity in mind. That means there's a daily working of the soul. There's a daily working of the heart. There's a daily working of the mind. Because it's not just about today, it's about eternity. And I know this isn't popular preaching, and I know like, and I haven't been preaching a lot of popular stuff anyway, but I want you to consider your relationships, your engagements, your temporal items. I'm not telling you to sell everything and run and, 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 and give it to the poor. I am saying consider how you're working your soul, your mind, your heart, your mission, and salvation. Because that influences your today. Because you are not just here for today. You are here for eternity. So what about the poor and what about the rich? The poor, the glory of the poor is in their eternal position in God. The glory of the rich is temporal in what they love. And James is challenging us that if we're going to make it through trials, we have to ask ourselves this question. Are we living from or for what's eternal? Are you living for what lasts forever? And are you living from a bank that lasts forever? Consider Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away. Inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us eternal glory that outweighs everything. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary and what is unseen is eternal. We see, here's what I want you to get. We see the wealth, but not eternity of life. Our real hope is in what lasts forever. It's not enough to live for what lasts 100 years, or even 1,000 years, or 10,000 years. We were created to live for eternity in Christ. I want you to think about it like a tape measure. And imagine if on the tape measure, we got the tape measure going all the way out, and we're stretching the tape measure all the way out, we're stretching the tape measure all the way out. And if your life every year, let's say the average person lives 70 to 80 years, and um, this tape measure, if I were to have it out, would stretch from one end of the stage to the other end of the stage. And on that tape measure, we were to mark what would be a demarcation of 100 years. It'd be about 21 inches. I still have, sorry, 21 feet. I would have so much more room on that tape measure because my life, when it ends, has so much more left in eternity with Christ. Right? We're constantly looking at life like the life on earth. But living in Christ, life in Christ, is forever. So maybe you live to be 100, great. But 100 in light of eternity is a blink of an eye. Maybe you live to be 110. People are living to be 110 or 120 nowadays. Great. But that is a blink of an eye. So how do you live life in such a short period? By looking at it, not today before eternity, right? What James is arguing is whether or not you have a lot or a little, are you living from what's eternal? And are you living for what's eternal? Now, I'm gonna say this really quickly. What I'm saying right now, what I'm about to get into, sounds real, real privileged, and I recognize that. I just wanna unearth this text and prayerfully apply it to our context, so hear me out. How much of your work is for eternity? And I'm not talking just, I'm talking retirement, life planning, all of that. I am talking that. But I'm also not just talking that. And I'm not saying don't work. I'm not saying don't be smart with your money. I'm not saying don't go to, I'm not saying any of that. Are you living and working your mind, your body, and your soul so that your possessions here help build the body of Christ because you're working the gifts that God has given you? What's eternal? Hope, wisdom, salvation, peace, fruits of the spirit. Let me be clear. James does not say being wealthy is wrong, and James is not saying give away all your money to the poor. James is not telling the poor to go get more money. James is asking a simple question, where's your trust? Where's your trust? The challenge, the text is unearthing in all of us, 
is the challenge we have to trust God because it's not just trusting God in trials, it's trusting God, hear this, with our choices. Before you push me away, listen to Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker said this in a work, Harvard Business Review, he said, in a few hundred years in the history of our time is written, from a long-term perspective, it's likely that the most important event historians will see is not technology or the internet, not e-commerce, it's an unprecedented change in the human condition. For the first time, literally, substantial, rapidly growing numbers of people have choices. And for the first time, they will manage themselves, and society is unprepared for that. Don't mishear me today. We have choices. $50,000 in Providence is not the same as $50,000 in Boston. $70,000 in Providence is not the same as $70,000 in rural Vermont. Millionaires are looking up to billionaires, wishing they had more money. Thousandaires are looking up to other thousandaires. Folk in this five figures looking up at folk in six figures. Folk in low six figures looking up to folk in mid six figures. We're all looking at more. We all want more. There's nothing wrong with moving and growing and learning. But here's what I want you to grab. Are you trusting God with your choices? The whole part of this text is trust. Everything from James 2 down to James, James, James 10 is trust. So let me show you how wealthy you are. Because if I were to ask the question about like, do you think I'm wealthy? Or do you think the person next to you is wealthy? Do you think someone who commented earlier is wealthy? You'd probably say yes or no, you know, right? based on what you perceive and know about that individual. I want you to show how wealthy you are. Did you have the choice of what shoes to wear this morning? Did you have the choice of what clothes to put on this morning? Those of you who are married or even single, did you have a choice of how many, what vehicle you wanted to drive this morning? I want you to see the, the, the privilege in this choice. Do you have insurance? Did you work from home? And do you have the ability to decide when you work from home or go in an office? Do you have internet? That when the free internet from the city ran out, you still had internet. Are you using a cell phone? You have a house phone and a cell phone? Do you decide what you do on weekends and evenings? Or are you told what to do? I want you, when we take the money away from what wealth is and look at wealth as being choices and wealth as being trust, a whole lot of us are a lot more wealthy than we want to admit. You're not told what to do with your weekends. You're not told what to do with your evenings. You have a choice of shoes. You have a choice of clothing. You have multiple vehicles. You have health insurance. You have dental. My God. You know what a Roth IRA is. You know what investments, like you, you have a financial planner on speed dial. I mean, I want you to really put this in perspective that wealth speaks to, like Peter Drucker says, our choices. And can you trust God with your choices? I can make this into a quick race sermon, but I don't want to go to race today, right? I want us to look at you and consider your choices. I'm not slamming financial planning, but you have choices. And what James is showing us is being wealthy is not a sin. How you view your wealth is a sin. You have everything you need in Jesus. Do you choose to see that? I told you last week, God wants the best for you. I told you last week, ask a giving God. I'm telling you today that being humble means you're gifted. I'm telling you right now that you have every spiritual blessing in Jesus. Do you make the choice to see that? That's prosperity. That's prosperity. Poverty, prosperity, but I wanna end with this. The book in to the first section and the first movement of the book of James, verse 12. Look at verse 12 in your Bibles. I want to read it from two different translations. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials, I mean, sorry, verse two, of many kinds, because you know the trusting of your faith produces perseverance. Verse two through three. So that's the first, the cover of the book. Look at the bookend to this text, verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, as having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Consider it joy when you face trials. Blessed are those who persevere receive the crown of life. 
all throughout the New Testament, we hear about these different crowns. We, we read about crowns. You can find them. They'll be in the Bible app. Those of you who have the Bible app, more in events, and you can find all this stuff. There's the imperishable crown in 1 Corinthians. There's a crown of rejoicing in 1 Thessalonians. There's a crown of righteousness in 2 Timothy. There's a crown of glory in 1 Peter. There's a crown of life in James and in Revelation. What are these crowns? Are they literal crowns? We don't know. Though the word crown there in the Greek is the word stephanos. Um, they were literal things, but they're different things. Brides... My wife actually had one of these at our wedding. Brides would wear a crown of Stephanos on their head. as a crown of leaves on their head. It was a joyful and festive crown. Is that the crown we're talking about? I don't know. Kings. It's amazing to me, by the way, that we pick the picture of kings and metal crowns whenever we talk about crowns. We don't talk about the crowns of like new life and regeneration and, and virginity and purity, the ones that we say brides. Anyway, there's, there's, the, there's, the, there's also the crowns that would be given to people who want a race. And that's the ones that you run a race and be crowned uh, with a crown. There's a physical reality of crowns, but this passage is probably not about the physical reality of crowns, because the best reading of this text is not the English, but it's the Greek. The Greek of this text says, and he will, she will, receive a crown, comma, which is life. Totally different. The crown of life and the crown, comma, which is life. What does that mean? The crown of life is divine in verses 2 through 4. Whole life, wholehearted life, the life that God intended, and not lacking anything. It's life right now. Persevere under trials. Recognize your idols now, that you might grow in Christ's likeness, because the fullness of life is promised to those who love him. And if you persevere, you'll receive the crown, comma, which is life. So how do you do it? Well, go to John 14, my last scripture to give you today. Go to John 14, look at verse 15. If you love me, keep my commands. Verse 21, whoever keeps my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. Show your, our love of God is our response to his love for us. How do I say that? He loved us while we were sinners. We love Christ not to get something. But we love Christ because he first loved us. Loving Christ gives us life now, that we might have life for eternity. In trials and tribulations, James says, listen, there's times we're going to acknowledge the times in our lives that we have poverty, but be exalted. There are times you acknowledge your wealth, be humble, because we're running a race to persevere so we might gain the crown, which is life. Live for eternity don't live for today but as you live for eternity you'll gain today peace joy and happiness and long suffering and patience your money is not bad don't worship it your joy is not bad don't worship it and receive the crown comma which is life live I, there's a song a couple years ago and we started it with a midweeks thing we had called living your best life. I want you to live life and live life to the fullest and receive the crown, but that's through perseverance, challenging your idols, asking and giving God and believing that God truly wants the best for you. Would you pray with me? God, today in the places in our lives where we are focused so much on today, we're missing out on what you desire for us in every day and for eternity. Allow us to see our lives for eternity, our marriages with eternity, our children with eternity, and that we might see how you're at work doing a great work. Thank you for the trust you've given us to do great work in us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're here today, you don't know Christ, or you do know Christ, or you're looking for a place to build your relationship with Christ, we believe we're a great space to do it. We're not perfect people, we're imperfect people serving a perfect God, trying to do his work. And so if that's you, simply text the phrase, yes, Jesus, to 84576, yes, J yes, us to 84576. We would love to pray with you, learn more about you, and connect with you. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he wore it white as snow. Lord, 
now indeed I find Thy power and Thine alone Can change the leprous spots And melt the heart of stone Jesus made it all All to Him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain He wore it white as snow For nothing good have I Whereby I Thy grace to claim I'll wash my garments white In the blood of Calvary's Lamb Jesus paid it all All to Him I owe Sin had left a crimson he walked in white as snow And when before the throne I stand in Him complete Jesus died my soul to save My lips shall still repeat Jesus made it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he wore it white as Well, I pray you guys were blessed by James. Thank you to the Mets for our hymn today. Um, thank you to Courtney for engaging with Connection. You guys have heard a lot of things happening here, the work we're doing, and the Word of God. Um, we ended our sermon today talking about how the love of Christ, what it compels us to do, what the love of that Christ loved us, that while we were, He was. Right? Never forget that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so Christ gives us the crown, comma, which is life. Communion becomes a chance for us to build community. Communion becomes a chance for us to commune together with him, that Jesus, while we were against him, welcomed us to the table. And so no matter what you think drives you away from the table of our body, the body of Christ, you're welcome today. We practice here at our church an open communion table. That means we're not checking your credentials. We're not going around and checking and see whether or not you're saved or not. We're believing that based upon your confession of faith and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are, and we welcome you. We practice uh, communion on the first Sunday simply because it's the time our, our tradition has chosen when to practice communion. Jesus says as oft as you come together to break bread. And what Jesus is saying there is every time you go out to eat, every time you go to a restaurant, every time you, 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 you break open bread to eat your hot dogs, and even tomorrow or today when you bust open that grill to make your, put your brats on there, do this in remembrance of me. Every time bread is broken, Christ is reminding you of his presence. That's communion. So we have bread and we have wine here today, and all this is simply reminding us is engendering that community that Jesus has with us, that he, that while we were yet, he was. Thanks be to God for that. So would you pray with me for this communion service? God, thank you that this is just another reminder of your love toward us. Use this moment, this feeble moment together to remind us of how present you are, how much love you have for us, that while we were, you always are. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. The night when Jesus was betrayed, one of my favorite characters in the story of communion is a certain man. The Bible says there was a certain man who the disciples, Jesus told the disciples to go to that would prepare the upper room. A certain man. Are you that certain person? What, here's what the certain person did. That certain man made sure that everything was laid out. And on that layout, 
was something simple that Jews practice in Passover that was unleavened bread and wine. It's the normal delicacy of the time was just white wine that they were making the time in the era that Jesus was around. And so they took Jesus, then took something that was normal and gave meaning to it, like you. He took something that was normal, your normal gifts, your normal talents, and gave meaning to it. He took this unleavened bread and he broke it and said, take, eat my body, which was broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Every time you break bread, remember his body. You are the certain one. Let this normal breaking today remind you that nothing in your life is broken that Jesus can't bring back together. In Jesus, God, we thank you for the brokenness of this bread that reminds us of the brokenness of our lives. Use this to unify us back with your body and your cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Take the broken body of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the same manner, Jesus took the cup. After he supped, said, This cup should be the New Testament of my blood. Right of Hebrews said, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Today we take this believing and knowing that the power of Christ that was represented in the redemption and the pouring out and the shedding of the blood and the water that came out of Jesus' side cleanses us not just from the outside in, but the inside out. May today, may this opportunity cleanse whatever you think is against your relationship with Christ, cleanse you that you might reflect the Lord Jesus Christ in the world. Father, bless this as we bring it in. Let it represent more than what it, we see, that we might see that you love us beyond what we can see. You love us from the inside out too. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake together. And after that, they sung a hymn, went to the highways and byways. Um, and celebrated in a very interesting way and then fled. Whatever's in you today that causes you to want to flee from Christ, may that be rebuked in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and may you run forward and grab a hold of the commission when Jesus gives you that commission in 11 days. Um, no matter what your week has for you in the future, no matter what you have in store for you this week, know this, that this indeed will be your best week. You are somebody, the somebody God loves, somebody God needs, somebody the world doesn't know they can't live without. May you go into this week knowing that you are more than a conqueror in the Lord Jesus Christ. No matter your poverty, no matter your prosperity, you have a promise to wear the crown, which is life. So let me get my, I don't know, my break on. I don't know, because it's July 4th weekend. Live your best life because you have the crown, which is life. You got this. Have a wonderful week.